Okay, welcome everyone to our bi-monthly seminar, Symmetries in Newcastle. Our first speaker of the day is Federico Berlai from the University of the Basque Country, and he'll be talking about from hyperbolicity to hierarchical hyperbolicity. So go on, Federico. Yes, so uh, thank you very much for the um introduction and yes thank you for um, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh here in australia it's the first time i speak in australia and it's the first time i'm speaking at seven in the morning because here it's seven in the morning but okay i'm very uh awake so good um let me just mention that now my say my work is funded by a um Austrian Science Fund named FWF, so Schrodinger Fellowship, and this and that this is joint work with Bruno Bruno Robbio, uh, who is a, a PhD student here in Bilbao, um, not of mine, uh, but okay. So um, yes, and yeah. So the title is uh, so the talk is titled from hyperbolicity to hierarchical hyperbolicity and yeah the plan of the talk is not to give a definition of uh, what an hyperbolic uh, sorry hierarchical hyperbolic space and group is uh, precisely because this is quite uh, heavy and long and technical uh, what i will try to do is to give um, a motivation um, of hierarchical so hhs's and hhg's and um, a, an intuition behind the definition so why people looked at, at these um, spaces and groups and why uh, why uh, they did so and what they they thought of achieving by considering these um, uh, notions and in particular, we will look at what happens in, in the mapping class group uh, case. Um, the mapping class groups of, of, of surfaces of finite complexity, say, um, are, well, well, one of the canonical examples of hierarchical hyperbolic groups. We'll see what happens here and uh, there and what uh, can be extracted from uh, the mapping class group um, case to, to be generalized to the well, to the um, HHG uh, scenario. Um, well, after that, after this introduction part, we will stare at the result saying that the graph product of HHGs is again, shares again an HHG structure. And um, well, and we will see how, well, we will see. We will, I will tell you that this result on graph products actually um, um, is deduced from a general, well, a more general combination theorem for graph of groups or say amalgamated free products of HHGs. And at the very end, we will uh, have a look at a, at a very, well, easy example uh, that maybe will, will um, let us understand what might happen in a more complicated um, in a more complicated case. Great. So before diving in into the uh, motivation part, let me just uh, define what an hyperbolic group is. So an hyperbolic group is, ah, yes. So every group here is uh, discrete. There is no topology. So countable, probably infinite group. And so what is, it, is an hyperbolic group? An hyperbolic group is a group um, in which, okay, if you consider its scaly graph with respect to a finite fixed generating set, in this scaly graph, which is a metric space, um, the geodesic triangles, so triangles obtained by uh, considering three vertices and drawing geodesics between these three vertices, these triangles are delta thin, um, meaning, well, as the picture suggests, if you consider any two sides of this um, triangle, and you consider the delta neighborhoods in this metric space of these two sites, the union of these two cover already also the third um, side. And the point here is that delta is 
uniform. So the, the delta does not depend on triangle on the triangle. And the, the striking thing about hyperbolic uh, groups is that, okay, you start with a very geometric definition, say, there is a very geometric starting point, but you are able to recover strong, say, algebraic or growth uh, properties for, for these groups. Uh, so for instance, hyperbolic groups are not just finitely uh, generated by finitely presented, they, they satisfy a strong form of teeth alternative, namely either they are virtually cyclic or they do have free non-abelian subgroups. So let me say, uh, finite groups satisfy trivially this, I, uh, this definition by taking delta to be the, say, the diameter of the finite Kelly graph. It's finite, so yeah. So either the group is finite or it's virtually infinite cyclic, or it will be, have exponential growth because there will be free non-abelian subgroups. So this is a, string, a stra um, strong form of Tietz alternative. So hyperbolic groups also have a linear then function, a linear isoperimetric inequality, and this is actually a characterization, and they have finite asymptotic dimension. Um, great. So already since the beginning of this hyperbolic um, business, well, it was noticed already by Gromov in his essay that several groups of interest, uh, of geometric interest, say, do not fit into this hyperbolic picture. And, and then already from the beginning, there was some, there were several attempts to, um, well, generalize uh, hyperbolicity in one way or another to, to try to fit into, well, this machinery, some, some families of interesting groups. Um, so the first thing to notice is that, okay, free products of hyperbolic groups are again hyperbolic, but um, direct product of hyperbolic groups are not hyperbolic. If both factors are infinite, then, well, each of the factor will contain uh, an element of infinite order, so there will be at least a Z, Z2, um, three abelian group of rank two in, in this, in this uh, direct product. And this is a, uh, it's something that uh, excludes hyperbolicity for the, for the direct product. Um, then if you look at three manifold, uh, sorry, hyperbolic three manifold, um, three manifolds with cusps, um, these cusps, um, well, exclude again hyperbolicity. Say the cusp is a torus or a surface of with higher genus. Um, well, these these cusps will create again uh, finitely generated free abelian subgroups in this pi one. So again, not hyperbolic. Or the mapping class group of a surface. Again, so the, the S will be a surface of finite genus. Uh, we will have a um, um, look in, uh, on with more detail just now. But let me say the mapping class group is just the group of um, orientation preserving homeomorph homeomorphisms of a surface up to homotopy or up to isotopy. These groups, uh, when they are not finite, they are finite with very low complexity. Um, when they are not finite, they are not hyperbolic uh, or not relatively hyperbolic. And many, say, rags or many groups acting on cat zero uh, cube complexes, uh, say, or product of trees, again, they are not um, hyperbolic um, because you will find free, uh, free abelian subgroups, for instance. So, yes, what are uh, yeah. what is hierarchical hyperbolicity is, is a common ground to treat all these classes that after all, they are not so different. Um, and still, well, the, the starting point is geometric uh, in a sense, looking at hyperbolic spaces, projections onto these hyperbolic spaces, but still the, the consequences are algebraic or you can recover algebraic consequences from this geometric starting point. Um, yes, 
Ah, yes, okay. So this notion was introduced by Jason Berstock, uh, Mark, uh, Mark Hagen, and Alessandro Sisto around 15, at least in, in archive, it, it appeared uh, in 15, I guess. And okay, so what are these consequences? Again, HAGs must be finitely presented. They now share a quadratic, not just linear, like hyperbolic group, but at most quadratic uh, then function. This, uh, this is not, uh, not an if and only if now. Uh, for instance, the amenable, non-amenable uh, Thompson group F, it's finitely presented, uh, it has quadratic then function, but um, it has as some groups Z to the N for any N. This implies that asymptotic dimension is infinite. And we know that the uh, asymptotic dimension of the any H and G is finite. So that Thompson group with quadratic time function is not an H and G. And they are, well, coarse median. Um, very good. So what are examples? Um, hyperbolic groups are hierarchical hyperbolic, and this will be clear. So the mapping class group of any surface with uh, finite complexity, um, say groups which are hyperbolic relative to H and Gs, so toral relatively hyperbolic means uh, hyperbolic rel relative to finitely generated free abelian groups. We will see, well, we will not see, but uh, rags in particular, uh, Z to the N are uh, hierarchical hyperbolic. So toral relatively hyperbolic will be um, hierarchical hyperbolic, or in particular limit groups, the, these fully residually free groups of Sela and, and others. And these are hierarchical hyperbolic. So uh, right angle Coxeter and Artin groups also, and many groups acting on cat zero cube complexes, say. And okay, free and direct product of those um, are again HAGs in contrast with hyperbolicity. Here also direct products uh, preserve this class of hierarchical hyperbolic groups. And um, again, in these groups acting uh, on cat zero cube complexes, say on product of trees, you find several instances of infinite simple groups. Again, in stark contrast with what happens in in the hyperbolic world. So, the the hyperbolic uh, simple groups are the finite simple groups. If you have an infinite hyperbolic group, it's very far away from being simple because uh, well, if you have um, non virtually Z uh, hyperbolic group, then there will be a normal infinite um, subgroup with infinite quotient. So far away from simple groups. So, what is the strategy? Uh, the strategy is to, um, well, try to study groups um, by, by, by means of a family of hyperbolic. Um, spaces, um, delta hyperbolic spaces for a uniform delta, uh, trying to project my group or our group G to these spaces, understanding the geometry over there, and then be able to recover coarsely, say, the geometry of the group with this information. And yeah, so what what is the strategy in action. So if you if you have an hyperbolic group already, then there is nothing to do. Uh, the family consists of one hyperbolic space, which is the group itself. The projection is clear, is the identity map, and there is nothing to um, to worry about here. So what happens for for a direct product of hyperbolic groups? Also here, the family is kind of clear. You have two factors. Uh, which are the hyperbolic spaces G and H. You have two projections, which are the projection on the first and on the second component. And this information, well, is enough to recover fully the, say, the geometry um, of the direct product once you remember, once you acknowledge that this is indeed a direct product, that the two factors commute. And well, this is in, in this world of 
hierarchical hyperbolicity, this is denoted by this perpendicular uh, symbol, which, which is called orthogonality relation. So whenever there will be non-trivial orthogonalities uh, appearing in, in our family curly, curly S of hyperbolic spaces, this will be witnessing that actually the, the original group is not hyperbolic. And so what happens for, for a mapping class group? Okay, so we start with a surface with genus G, uh, P punctures and B boundary components. Um, here I'm allowed to, to switch uh, punctures, but the boundary components are fixed um, point wise by by the homeomorphism uh, orientation preserving homeomorphisms uh, here also there is a canonical family of um, hyperbolic um, spaces uh, which are the curve complexes for um, well for the surface s uh, and the and for the subsurfaces v inside s and okay before before passing to the definition, let me just say that, okay, visualize two subsurfaces in a surface, you have three cases. Either one is already nested into the other, or they are disjoint, they don't intersect, or they do overlap in a non-trivial way, um, but neither is nested into the other. So this is kind of the, um, of the, well, general situation for, an hierarchical hyperbolic space. You have a family of hyperbolic spaces uh, with these three kinds of relations. There is a nesting, there is a well orthogonality relation that witnesses um, non-hyperbolicity of the original space or group. And then there is the, the negation. So transversality here is the negation of being orthogonality and nested. If you are not nested, not orthogonal to uh, well not orthogonal then th by definition you are transversal say and these subspaces so, are they up to homotopy yes yes of course uh, non, non essentially uh, disjoint or yes so um, yes again uh, let me uh, let me remind orthogonality here disjointness is witnessing um, non-hyperbolicity of the original thing in mean, the mapping class group because again um, consider two subsurfaces u and v inside s which are not uh, intersecting and consider the the mapping class groups of these subsurfaces u and v these mapping class groups live inside the mapping class group of s as subgroups and because this surfaces subsurfaces are disjoint in the big mapping 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 class group these two smaller mapping class groups generate their direct product any any mapping class group ma mapping class on one surface commutes with any other coming from the other surface because the surfaces are disjoint and again these will be direct products of infinite factors say of infinite subgroups witnessing non hyperbolicity of of the starting group already so what what are these uh, complexes so a curve complex is a simplicial complex so there will be vertices and simplices and edges say so any simple closed well homotopy class of a simple closed curve not homotopic into punctures or not homotopic into boundary component will be a vertex in this in this uh, complex and two vertices meaning two uh, simple closed curves are joined by an edge um, if we can draw them disjointly in in the surface so for instance these colored curves um, correspond to different um, vertices in, in the curve complex. And okay, the, the first heavy or deep theorem is that this complex is delta hyperbolic. This was proved by Mazur and Minsky in 99. And uh, well, the, 
the first striking thing is that the delta is not is not depending on the on the surface v so delta is uniform for all surfaces and other thing is that this complex uh, well is not locally finite so there will be infinitely many edges departing from a given from a given vertex but it's finite dimensional it's the the simplex of bigger dimension is of dimension well see com the complexity of the surface minus four great and that, okay now there there is a high-tech picture um in this picture i try to well describe some uh, canonical maps from the curve complex on s to smaller curve complexes so if you if you uh, see the picture there is a well subsurface uh, capital v and and a vertex in the uh, the green vertex in the curve complex c of s which is a closed curve from this closed curve that doesn't live in inside the subsurface v i can well i can create well in this case two uh, closed curves living in in v which are non-trivial, so they both appear there. Um, well, this is done in general. You, you need to look at the arcs of intersection of little green V with capital blue V. Um, and from these arcs of intersection, you, you, you construct in a canonical way um, curves that might be, some of them might be, uh, homotopic into points uh, so they are discarded but well from from this you th there is a canonical map from say canonical maps from curve complexes of bigger surfaces to curve complexes of smaller subsurfaces and because the the mapping class group on of s is quasi isometric to the curve complex of S, actually these maps, these projections, well, give you a map from, a projection from the mapping class group onto the uh, curve complexes of subsurfaces, uh, C of V. Um, great, and here there is nothing special of on picking S, the, the wall surface, you can, you can play this trick with any two subsurfaces, uh, say U and V, uh, U and V, and you can do this when the subsurfaces intersect. Maybe they are nested one into the other, or they intersect. When they don't intersect, there is no arc of intersection to start with, to create, um, to look at the images. And yeah, here I skipped something. Uh, in the second to last line well it's uh well it said that the curve complex of a small uh, subsurf well of a subsurface can be seen as a subspace a sub complex of the curve complex of a bigger um uh, surface because yeah simple closed curves in the smaller subsurface well are simple closed curves in in the bigger um, surface so there is a canonical map of the canonical way of seeing smaller complexes into the bigger uh, curve complex of s and actually um well this um, complex cv will be of bounded diameter inside the bigger one because well you will find curves living outside living in s minus v or yeah living say in s minus v so these will be points in in the bigger um, curve complex and because they can be realized disjointly from any vertex of cv there will be an edge in cs connecting that vertex with any vertex of cv so there will be a bound a uniform bound on the diameter of cv inside cs 
but okay, this is relevant for HHSs, but it's not relevant for the talk. So uh, forget about it if, if it's confusing. So great. So th the point is that here is that we have canonical maps from, well, the mapping class group onto curve complexes and canonical maps in between curve complexes when, when the two subsurfaces are not disjoint, so they are not orthogonal. Yeah, and the, another big theorem is that, also due to, uh, to Mazur and Minsky, is that this, um, say, uh, no, uh, these um, hyperbolic spaces and these projections are enough to um, control coarsely the, the geometry of the mapping class group. Uh, meaning that, uh, well, if you want to compute distances in mapping class group, you better, well, take two elements, X and Y, project them onto all the, uh, all these hyperbolic um, spaces, compute distances over, over there, sum, and what you will get is roughly the distance uh, in the mapping class group be between X and Y. Yeah, and here you need to be careful because this is an infinite sum. So you need to take a threshold uh, S and add uh, the distances just when it's, it's big enough. So this will give you a finite sum. Um, and uh, coarsely, this uh, well will give you the, the distance in the mapping class group. The, the important thing is that these thresholds S, S0, and K do not depend on, on the elements you choose. So these are uniform things. And yes, so. Um, that is what uh, can be extended to, to a bigger class of groups, or a bigger family of groups. And so HHSs are metric spaces for which this approach works and HHGs are the groups, well, the tact on a good way on an HHS. So uh, you will want to find a family of hyperbolic spaces, again, uh, uniformly delta hyperbolic projections from the space onto these hyperbolic spaces, projections in between these hyperbolic spaces, um, much more structure that is hidden from these slides. And with this machinery, you are able to control coarsely the, the geometry of your hierarchical hyperbolic space. So this is the same result as, as the distance formula in the mapping class group. So you want to project your points onto this family of um, hyperbolic spaces. Uh, compute distances over there, sum, sum up these things, and then this will give you coarsely, uh, uniformly, the, the distance in the, in the space. Great, and yeah, hyperbolic, hierarchical hyperbolic groups act in a, in a controlled manner on a hierarchical hyperbolic space, or, or you could say that a group is HAG if its scaly graph, which is a metric space, admits an HHS structure, which is compatible with um, the group acting on itself by left multiplication. So in particular, you want the, the group to act geometrically on an HHS, uh, such that there are finitely many orbits on this, uh, on this family of hyperbolic spaces. Well, this is, at first glance, this is horrible, but uh, these are reasonable assumptions once you are familiar with, with well, with this machinery. But yeah, not important for the for the talk. Okay, so um, our our first result in the direction of say graph products of HAGs was a result that has nothing to do with say groups or, or graph products, it's a technical result on, on say hieromorphisms, which are morphism of, morphisms of hierarchical hyperbolic spaces. Uh, well, it turns out that um, 
a weaker metric condition on, on these maps is already uh, equivalent to a stronger uh, metric condition on the map. And these uh, conditions are equivalent to some other conditions that are, are well detected in, inside, the, inside the hierarchical hyperbolic structures, um, curly S and curly S prime of X and X prime. And this is this is what we used. Um, and this is what we applied um, in the case of graph products later. So let me remind me uh, you what what a graph product is. Is just something that lives in between uh, direct products and pre products. Is given by a graph. For the uh, for the top, the graph will be finite because HAGs must be finitely presented. So uh, the graph must be finite and a family of groups indexed by the vertices of this graph. You take the free product of these groups and then you allow uh, commutation between vertices. If and whenever you see the corresponding edge uh, UW in, in the graph. And graph products split uh, canonically as amalgamated free products by looking at um, links of pick a, pick a vertex, look at the link of this vertex, which are the vertices uh, in the graph that are connected to V by an edge. Um, and this will be, well, you can, you can split along this subgroup um, any graph product. So if the, if the vertex V is central, this splitting is not, is not proper because the, the subgroup generated by vertices on the link will be actually the left hand side group generated by all the vertices except little v. So actually what you are seeing here is just a direct product, the, the right hand side of this amalgamated free product. If the vertex is not connected to any edge, this is a free product because the link is empty. But in general, well, this will be something that lives in, in, in between uh, direct and pre products. And well, the, revel, the relevant thing is that how is how you amalgamate the link inside the left hand side and the right hand side. You amalgamate it just by the identity map, which is an isometry, uh, say uh, an isometric embedding. So um, the second condition of this structural result is met in this graph product setting. So but by this result, we know that, well, the other conditions that are hidden here are also met um, in the graph product of say HAGs. And, and this is what we exploited to, to get, well, this result about HAGs. And now you are kind of confused because there are several um, things that are not defined, uh, at least three things. So what hieromorphisms are, what hierarchical quasi-convexity is, and what this star means, um, this asterisk means um, um, at the side of HAG. And that this is what I will define. Well, not define, uh, this is what I will uh, describe. So hieromorphism, um, is well it's a morphism between structure um, respecting the structure so because the structure is complicated also the euromorphism will be complicated and actually it consists of several maps so there is a map between say the spaces or between the the groups if we are looking at hags then there is a map at the level of families so there is an injective map from one family, curly S to curly into curly S prime, which respects this nesting orthogonality and transversality, meaning that if U and V are nested inside curly S, then their images will, will have the same nesting inside curly S prime and so on. And then, well, for, for then there are maps uh, in between uh, singular hyperbolic spaces. Well, you want uniform quasi-isometries between 
well, any hyperbolic space C u and the image of, well, C of the image of u. Again, this is quite horrible if it's the first time you look at, but it once you stare at it enough, it's these are the natural conditions that you must expect from from these morphies. Okay, but not relevant for the talk, the, the, the details. Great. So what is hierarchical quasi-convexity? So it's the generalization in this setting of hyperbolic um, normal quasi-convexity. So first of all, well, you, you might expect that if, you, if I want to define hierarchical quasi-convexity for, for a subspace, uh, say Y in, in X, I might at least expect that its image in any, in all the hyperbolic spaces in my family, its image is uh, quasi-convex. And this is the first condition. So the image in any hyperbolic spaces associated to my HHS or HHG is quasi-convex, but this is not quite enough. Um, you can uh, cook up some silly counterexamples that says, that shows that this is not, just this is not a sensible definition, uh, say. What you really need to, to say now, well, there are several uh, equivalent um, conditions that give you the right notion. One is this. This means that, okay, uh, given a, a subspace Y and given a little, a, a point little x in, in HH, um, in, the, in the HHS uh, space, sorry, in the HH space, if I know that when projected into any um, hyperbolic space, little x is close to um, the quasi-convex subspace, then I already know that this happens in the original hierarchical hyperbolic space. So there is a bound. If I know that when projecting little x is close to y, then I know that also before projection, this was, this was um, the case. And the point is that Again, here, this function that the k, it's a function, um, the function that gives, uh, well, these bounds is uniform, is given in, that, in advance. So it does not depend on the choice of little x. So there is a uniform, say, way to describe these, this dependence. Great. So with this notion, which is the sensible notion, you can prove, uh, well, for instance, what happens uh, well, the analogous of what happens in the in the hyperbolic uh, world that if you have a quasi-convex subspace of an hyperbolic space, then it is hyperbolic. So if you have a uh, quasi-convex subgroup of an hyperbolic group, it is hyperbolic. Um, yes. So just just the first condition is not enough because you can cook cook up uh, silly, example, silly counter examples that show that there is no way to just by the first of the two conditions uh, deduce uh, this kind of results, say. Very good. And what about HHS stars um, asterisk? Well, these are HHSs plus, well, two little conditions, uh, very natural that are known to be met in all known examples of hierarchical hyperbolic spaces and hierarchical hyperbolic groups. Uh, they might or might not follow from the definition. We don't know yet, or I don't know yet, uh, but they are very natural. So actually the, the conjecture, I mean, in, in our paper with uh, Bruno and the paper of Bruno and I, I think to be on the safe side, this is stated as a question, not as a conjecture. But um, we expect that at least, say, for hierarchical hyperbolic groups, uh, this should be true. Um, okay. So what are these two little properties? One is what we call we define it, and 
it's what we call intersection property. In, in the mapping class group, this says that if you have two subsurfaces and you consider their intersection, well, this intersection is a subsurface of S again. And this is true because, uh, because disclaimer maybe, you are not uh, bounded to, to take connected uh, subsurfaces. You can consider disconnected subsurfaces. So the intersection of two subsurfaces maybe have, has finitely many connected components, but it's a subsurface. So this means that this structure is a lattice. It's a lattice. So you have intersect joints and well wedges, say. The second component the second um, um, condition is well a little bit more obscure if you read it, but it's also very natural. And well, it says that okay, take V, an hyperbolic space, uh, in your in your structure, say, and if this v has something which is orthogonal to it, so this this set of w's orthogonal to v is non-empty, then there is a unique maximal which is orthogonal to v. What does it mean in in the mapping class group? Take a surf uh, sorry a subsurface v, and consider the complement of this subsurface in S. This is again another subsurface and this subsurface uh, v bar satisfies these two properties it is disjoint from v by definition and anything that is disjoint from v is nested lives inside this v bar so this is the condition which is called clean containers in the in the general setting this is very these two both of these are very natural and well are known to be true in in well all examples of hhs's to to the day and if you if you have uh, an operation say that preserves the class of hierarchical hyperbolic spaces and the class of, or the class of hierarchical hyperbolic groups then these operations also preserve this uh, the persistency of this property so um yeah very natural property so we don't know if these properties follow actually from the definitions or or not but um yes very natural okay so again um given a final simplicial graph and a family of hhgs hhg stars then we could prove that the graph product again is an hhg star so what is the strategy the strategy is to find an appropriate uh, hierarchical hyperbolic uh, space star um, thing and let the group act on it in, in a nice way and, and prove that this group acts as it should and it's an HAG. What is the space? Well, it's constructed using, well, Busser theory. So the, as I said, the, the graph product splits non uh, well canonically as a, uh, as an amalgamated free product this amalgamated free product um, well is a graph of groups it uh, it acts on a Busser tree and you can endow this Busser tree with metric spaces um, well this is what Besvina and Fein did uh, like 20 years ago no well 30 years ago uh, already and well this is a well-defined metric space and well then you prove and this is very tedious and long but it, it's true that the group uh, the graph product acts as it should on this on this hierarchical hyperbolic space um say uh, g acts geometrically with finite orbits on, on this space. And this is the case. So last week, um, yeah, I received, I don't know if this is already on the archive, but I received an email, um, well, with this result, saying in particular that graph product of HAGs are HAG without this star. This is proof, this is done by Berlin and Russell. Uh, it's proven in a completely different way. They, they do prove that 
it's it's well our paper is quite long their papers is quite long uh, both are technical so i didn't read their paper yet but they prove this using a different strategy and they do it by proving that graph products are say hierarchically hyperbolic relative to the vertex groups so when you plug in hierarchical hyperbolic stuff in the vertex groups from that result you you um reduce well you deduce this so again in our in our result there is little star appearing uh, which well so I, we don't know if this little star um um follows from the definitions or not or it's an additional um requirement but okay our result follows from a more general say combination theorem for graph of groups or amalgamated free products this is done for graph products um, this the the result the the nice result of berlin and russell is done for graph products so well it's more general and less general at the same time or our result is more general and less general at the same time um but yes yeah well okay this is the more general version of of our result from which then we deduce um the the say corollary on the result on um graph products because graph products again split as amalgamated free products in a nice way um but yeah i don't want to to comment much on this uh, there are there are um well words that are not defined like comparison maps uh well hierarchical cosy convex we saw edge embeddings well uh, i will not i will skip this and we will end with with a nice example uh, maybe or but easy example at least so yeah besvin and fein they proved that okay if you have say this is a not the most general version of their theorem so start with a free group free non-abelian group f and start with and and consider an hyperbolic automorphism of, uh, of f so it's it's an expansive say automorphism or you have the definition here of what hyperbolic automorphism um, means well what they proved is that this um, hnn extension or mapping tori is again um, an hyperbolic group so this is a semi-direct product uh, between uh, f and, and an infinite cyclic group and it's again hyperbolic and well it's an HNN extension so it's a uh, it's a graph of groups let's try to apply uh, our result of here final graph of groups the the free group is hyperbolic so it's an hierarchical hyperbolic group let's try to apply this so how well another high-tech uh, picture uh, so you have your graph of groups on on the left hand side um so the the identity well phi is an automorphism so the edge group f has index one on both uh, in both uh, embeddings say uh, or inclusions of the edge group inside the vertex group so any any vertex in the buster tree which is the the line on the upper side of the picture will have two neighborhoods one plus one the index of f in f and the index of phi of x in s in f so two um two neighborhood neighbors well so you have your line which is the buster tree you endow well the buster tree with um hierarchical hyperbolic groups say which are the free group f and the family of hyperbolic spaces associated to f which is just given by one hyperbolic space which is f again and the, you do the same for edges and then there are edge inclusions given by by well constructed in terms of this uh, maps in the graph of groups so the, the green identity and the blue uh, hyperbolic automorphism great so so far so good 
And now, well, you need to look at, well, projections onto these families of hyperbolic spaces, which is consisting of one element. So we, can see, we, we look at the family of, sorry, at the projection from F group onto F uh, hyperbolic space, pi of F, uh, you see them. And well, and well, there are some, these are the comparison maps, the obscure comparison maps that appeared in the previous slide. You, you have these maps that uh, relate uh, an hyperbolic space F coming from one vertex to any other hyperbolic space coming from a different vertex. The point is that, um, the point, the crucial point is that uh, our result does not apply here exactly because um, the, the automorphism phi is hyperbolic. So it's expansive. So it, de it dilates, sorry, it um, dilates or whatever. Well, it expands, um, well, or it, it increases distances. So these comparison, these maps um, on the bottom side here, phi composition identity to the minus one, there will not be, or say a, a composition of finitely many of these, they will not be uniform quasi isometries because you have, well, infinitely many hyperbolic spaces F related by these maps and there is no, not a uniform bound on, on well, the, the quasi isometry constants of of on these uh, on these compositions of phi phi to the n um, is not, the, the family of phi to the n for all n in z is not a unim a unim is not uniformly a family of quasi isometries. Each of one each one of these individually is a quasi isometry. Actually, is an uh, sorry is a quasi isometry. Yes, but it's not. Um, it's not uniformly the family and this is exactly what goes wrong so we cannot apply our result uh, to deduce say hyperbolicity of this mapping tori what is nice is that instead if instead of considering phi you consider the identity map so you actually have a, a direct product of f and z well this group is not hyperbolic anymore but it is uh, hierarchically hyperbolic because it's the direct product of two nice hyperbolic spaces f and z and actually in that case in that silly case say our complicated um, combination theorem applies and it recovers the so this very complicated machinery that we developed um, for graph of groups say in this silly case well, spits out the same um, family of hyperbolic groups that you would get if you just look at this direct product as a direct product. Um, so that's that. Uh, but okay, I wanted to to look at this example because well, it's an example of it's a nice and easy example of a amalgamated say uh, sorry amalgamated not. It's a nice example of a uh, graph of groups and well it's it sees we, we see how at least well from the graph of groups we look at the buster tree and then you start endowing vertices and edges with hierarchical hyperbolic spaces and blah blah blah. In general, if if you consider a more general uh, say graph of groups, the, the valency on of each vertex will be infinite because probably the, the index of an edge group inside a vertex group is infinite. So you, you will not have a locally finite space, say. So things are much more complicated than this, but this is a nice tool, uh, tool example to, to think about this. And yeah, with this, I finish the talk. So thank you. Thank you for the talk, Federico. Are there any questions from the audience?
well does not seem like it so let's thank Federico again and now uh, excuse me yeah I yeah. have a question can you hear me yes yes ah, okay hello Federico hello. Uh, I wanted to ask you if um, you could give an example of an cylindrically hyperbolic group, uh, which is not an HHS. For instance, a relatively hyperbolic group. Sure. Uh, so, yes, this is very easy. I mean, stated like this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, for instance, um, say any free product of, say, non trivial groups is relatively hyperbolic because it's relatively hyperbolic yeah. to the two factors, the free product. And you also know that um, HAGs are finitely presented, must be finitely presented. So if you yes. start with, say, two groups which are not finitely, present, finitely generated, but not finitely presented, and then you consider their free product, this group will not be finitely presented, but it will be relatively hyperbolic. Because it, so will be it, it, will not, it will not be an HHG. Uh, okay, thank you. And another question was, uh, yeah. if you take uh, a ball in an HHS and you project the ball uh, to this uh, curve complex, then the projections are bounded, are uniformly bounded. If you take a ball... Um, yeah, you have mm -hmm. a ball. Mm -hmm. uh, of uh, no, no matter what radius and then is there a constant uh, such that the projection uh, has bounded diameter for every wall so a uniform constant for any yeah, ball it's, it's like the statement is like there is a, a constant c such that when you take a ball in your hyperbolic space and you project mm -hmm. that ball in the curve complex of your hyperbolic, uh, hierarchical hyperbolic space, then this, the diameter of this projection is bounded. Wow, by the constant or in terms of the constant? In terms of the constant. Uh, it's like in the hyperbolic space, uh, I don't know how to put you an example, but uh, when you project in a quasi-convex set, then uh, projections of balls, if are far apart from the from the quasi-convex set, uh, they are bounded always. Sure. It's like you're contracting the balls to a... Uh-huh, yes, yes. Um, maybe, now, now I don't have a clear okay, idea. Okay, don't worry. But let me, well, I will think about this. Maybe the answer is easy maybe or not, say but... No. Sorry? Sorry? Intuitively, I would say no, because take a direct product of two groups, of two hyperbolic groups, that whole thing is HAG. And as, as, as big a ball, you project oh, uh, it, uh, the image of the ball when you project it to a product will be, well, as big as the ball you took. Yeah. So, yeah. Usually this happens uh, with the, the axis of loxodromic elements in hyperbolic space. Because besides, apart from being a, a quasi-convex, they verify this property of having bounded projections. But thank you anyways. <laughs> yeah, I'm not an expert on hyperbolic stuff, so <laughs> I might say something that makes no sense whatsoever. I was just following the intuition that Federico gave. Okay, so I believe that if there are no other questions, uh, we can thank Federico one more time. Thank so you for again. To hit your uh, reaction emojis. <laughs> and now we head on to the coffee break. <laughs>